All right, the book of James, part 15. Um, I'm going to be skipping uh, a lot of the intro, and uh, we're going to go uh, into a little bit of where we left off, but then continue to go forward. So I just want to go to the scriptures, and we'll start with the scriptures, and we'll know what we're talking about. Uh, in James 5, verses 7 to 12. It says, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious seed of the earth. And patiently. That's right, until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Uh, my brethren, take uh, the prophets who spoke in the time of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the uh, perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no lest you fall into judgment. So going into the New Living Translation, and it says, dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience in suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no, so that you will not sin and be condemned. Uh, again, so today's lesson is James 5, uh, 7 through 12, when you are being oppressed. With the introduction, do not feel like, uh, do you feel like someone is out to get you, that you are trying to take, uh, uh, that they are trying to take advantage of you, that you are being oppressed. Uh, what should you do when you are oppressed? What should you not do? James 5, James gives instructions to those who appear to have been oppressed by the rich. Notice in James 2, 6, but you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? The rich has been holding back their wages in James 5, 4. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord uh, of heaven's armies. And then six, to see the rich have been oppressed, oppressing the righteous. James 5 and 6, you have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. So what, are, what were the oppressed Christians to do? James 5, 7 through 12, we read that. And surrounding verses, we find principles, instructions, which should govern Christians when they are oppressed. These principles are just as applicable today. When we are oppressed by others, they include, this is what we went over last week, don't resist. Uh, such was the behavior of those being oppressed in James' day. James 5, 4, and 6. You notice, uh, though treated unjustly, they did not resist. So we spent pretty much our entire lesson last week on not resisting. And I think there was a lot of, of interaction in that. Uh, what I want to make sure that we understand is when it says don't resist, it's not telling you to um, lay down uh, and be trampled over. Uh I think more than anything was trying to tell us what not to do is to, you know, don't retaliate. You know, people are going to treat you specific ways because of who you are and who you stand for. 
Um, but you cannot take it as a personal issue because you're going to be just as um, that's the word I'm going to use um, treated falsely just like Jesus did. You know, he had to go through many a times when, you know, people did and said and tried to uh, pressure him into all kinds of things. And they're going to do the same thing to us. Uh, we cannot turn our backs on that, but we don't allow them to just rule and run over us. We have to use wisdom. Jesus did that mostly, and I, I love how he did it, in the garden. I mean, I'm sorry, in, in the wilderness. Um, he was at his lowest point physically being have fasted 40 days. So physically, he was unable to, you know, really uh, strike back with anything of a natural nature. But what he did do, which was much more uh, advantageous to him, was use the word of God as his sword, as his weapon, and that's what we are to do. Uh, whether we speak it into uh, the atmosphere or we just utilize it in order to strengthen ourselves, I remember how David had to encourage himself in the Lord. A lot of times when we're going to be, you know, ridiculed or we're going to be talked about, or people are going to try to uh, do things to us as opposed to retaliate, sometimes we have to just strengthen ourselves. You realize that if they would do it, if they did it to Jesus, they're going to do it to us. So we don't. When it talks about not resisting, we're going to be treated unjustly unfairly, and, and, and unfairly. Know that. That's coming. But we're being told not to resist. So I don't want to spend much more time on that. Um, but you'll have all the information when I send out the uh, hard copy. Uh, so it is not easy to keep oneself from resisting and to wait for the Lord to take care of it. That's why there is a need for this next principle. And that is be patient. Uh, before I go further, be very, very careful when you ask God for patience. Yeah. That's one of the things that I really try to um, discourage people from asking God for it. If you're not the type of person that you can endure, because God will give you patience, but then he's going to give, you know, things will happen for you to utilize that patience. You're going to now have to be patient. I'm not going to tell you don't do it, but make sure that it's in the right frame uh, of your mind and your abilities to wait on God. So to be patient, the word found here is slightly different than that found earlier in this epistle. James one and three, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The word is hypomone, 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 or hypomone. I want to, to uh, 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 pronounce it. Um, that is the um, Greek word for patience in this text here. But notice what it says, the testing of your faith. So just because you have faith doesn't mean you're not going to be tested of it, and you will be. But knowing that you can survive and utilize in your faith, that's what's going to produce the patience, which means to bear up under trials which normally means to be patient in reference to things or circumstances. We want instant gratification in a lot of things, and that's not how uh, we are as children of God supposed to see uh, our issues and situations being resolved. We have to have faith. We have to have patience, and that's when we know our tests are going to come. Because the enemy's not going to just allow you to just receive everything right now, right here. No, he's going to do everything he can to keep you from receiving the blessings of God. So you're going to have to bear up, up under these trials. Or know that when he is on his attack of you, that you can endure. 
James 5, 7 and through 8, and then 10, the word is Macroth Yameo. Macroth Yameo. Which means to suffer long. These things are, are, are not easy. I told you guys last week that this, these passages of scripture here, 5 through 12, this is some of the most difficult things that we as God's children are going to have to go through. We talked about you have, you're going to have the, the testing of your faith that produces your patience. And now we're also telling you that you're going to have to sometimes suffer long, which means, hey, it's, it's not going to be overnight. It may take a little bit of you going through. You may have to uh, forget about thinking about the outcome and know that while you're in the midst of it, that God is with you and that you can make it through. I'm always reminded of marathon runners. Those ones who uh, can run fast and make it through at the beginning. But then you have those ones who may lag towards the end, but they never give up. Some of the last ones that cross the line, but they cross the line. They don't stop in the middle of the race. They may be hobbling, you know, dehydrated, sore muscles, cramping, but they go through. That's all that suffering process. But their goal is to cross the line. Sometimes in the midst of that, they don't think about that line crossing. It's, can I make the next step? Let me just make the next step. Let me just make the next step. I, 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 has anybody ever seen, um, uh, what's the name of that movie, Michelle? Uh, uh, um, Hacksaw Ridge. You guys ever saw the movie Hacksaw Ridge or you haven't seen it, you really need to see that movie. This is regarding the uh, conscientious objector in World War II who became, he was a medic. And they were up on this, this hill, this ridge, where the Japanese were just pounding them. But they had to keep going. But his job was to take the wounded and get them out. One of the things he kept on saying, Lord, just give me the strength to get one more. Let me get one more. If I could just get one more. He wasn't thinking about coming down the hill. He knew he had to suffer. He knew he had to go through it, but just give me one more. And that's what that's some of the things, the mindset that we need to do when we're going through these situations. Lord, let me make one more step. Let me hang on a little bit longer. Help me make it through this next round got to suffer long, which normally means to be patient in reference to people like oppressors. Lord, if I could just put up with them for one more day, then that day goes by. Lord, help me put up with them for one more day. That goes by. Lord, help me put up with them for one more day. We have these type of people that are in our lives that cause you to have to say, Lord, I got to be patient with them. It's going to take something. They're people just like me, and think about it. How many times have people probably said that about you? So we have to have that type of mentality and that type of spirituality to know we got to suffer long and be patient with people. As Vincent, Vincent defines it, patient holding out under trial a long protracted restraint of the soul from yielding to passion, especially the passion of anger. You can't get mad. You want to be mad. You want retribution. But you got to also realize, and I say it all the time, you're not fighting a person anyway. You're fighting a spirit. Even up under these, these oppressions, it's a spirit that has its whole grand design to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the thought links itself naturally with that in the preceding verse, the righteous does not resist. Three examples of given to encourage us to be patient. Here's three examples in the word of God. First one is the farmer. 
James 5, 7 says, brothers, dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait on the Lord's return. Continue to find who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest he rightly. I don't know where we were. We were driving somewhere. We saw all this. I, I, I know what it was. We were headed to Cleveland or we were on the way home from Cleveland. You can see all the all the um the uh, the corn fields that you know are far right and they're ready for harvest. It's probably just feed corn by now. It's not eating corn. They had it has its purpose too, and they're just waiting for the right time. Get that in. And then they can do what they need to do with it. But the farmer knows he needs that spring rain, he needs that fall rain. And just like us, we need the former and the latter rain to help us to be prepared for what we have coming. But we got to be patient. You can't, you know, rush it. It's in God's time. And the prophets, another example, James 5 and 10. For examples of patience in suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look for the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. These, these, these prophets, they told of things to come. A lot of the prophecy was, it was harsh. They didn't always want, to, I'm sure they didn't always want to give it, but it was a word that had to be given and patiently wait for the outcome for it to be. Especially with the children of Israel. Well, it was prophesied that they would return. But in one instance, it took them 70 years for them for that prophecy to come you know, around. They've been held in captivity, captivity in Babylon. It took 70 years, a whole generation of people to be moved out before that could happen. But it's all about the patience. And then finally, Job. Down in 5.11, we give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. Job had a lot before he lost. He lost everything. But he still had to endure. He still had to be patient. He still had to stand for God. His wife at one time told him, curse God and die. His friends really were like, man, what are you doing? What have you done to cause this to happen to you? Man, you need to just, you know, come on, man, let it go. But Job had to be patient. And his impatience, his patience and his endurance allowed God to see him through all of this and then reward him with much more than he had before he started. See, each of these examples teaches us, one, to place our trust in the Lord, that he will eventually reward us for our trust in him. Two, to be steadfast in the meantime in our service to him. Doesn't matter what things look like, we still have got to serve him. Are there any questions or comments on being patient? No. Pretty self-explanatory, I do believe. Okay. But such patience or long suffering is not easily acquired. And it's not. Therefore, there's a need to apply the third principle to this passage. That is establish your heart. The word establish means to fix, make fast, and to start. is translated strengthen in other places. To establish one heart then involves strengthening our heart in a certain way. Here it means to strengthen our hearts so as to be patient and not resist evil being done. So in order to establish this, you have to set your mind and your heart to know Number two, I can make it through. Number three, God will never look at me. God is with me. God's going to be with me. He's going to see me through. The key to establishing our hearts is the word of God. 
and the Peter 1 and 12. Therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. Got to stand on the word of God. The constant and careful study of God's word, our faith in God and his virtual justice is made stronger. Patience and strength to not resist is developed. Romans 15, verse 4. Those things were written in the scriptures long ago. And the scripture gives us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promise to be fulfilled. Every day, you need to be feasting on the word of God. I'm not telling you to spend hours and hours and hours reading God's word every day. But every day, you need to have gotten something in you that will prepare you for the day's journey. Uh, there are many apps on you know, your phone or whatever that gives you daily verses or gives you daily encouragement. Nothing other than that. Every day, something that's going to help you get your day started. And throughout the day, you know, peer into some of God's word. I know we, do. we are very busy. We have a lot of things that we do in life, especially when we're working at our jobs. You know, but if, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know anybody outside of a person working out in the field. If you're sitting at a computer, everybody's got some type of time that we take and we go on the Facebook or we go to the internet and we search something. I don't care who it is. Everybody's going to look at something else on their computer. Oh my God. Take a moment and look at something that will give you some inspiring word of God. If you can look at a cute baby or you can look at a dog you know, or whatever, take the time, same time you want to take to do that, and look at God's word. Strengthen yourself. Pre prepare yourself. Establish yourself. Make sure that you are set and ready because trouble is coming. There's some going on. Are there any questions about establishing your house? No, there's a lot of something. Huh? There's a lot of feedback, something going on. Well, somebody, I am doing a lot of feedback. Can you just mute everybody? Uh, I don't know what it is. It's gone now. It's gone now? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. Okay, that's cool. Okay. So let's go back. Beautiful. All right. So. Okay. Oh, man, I can't read. I got this in my way and I cannot see. I don't know how to get rid of that. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to leave. Let me see here. I cannot see. All right, well, the, 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 the fourth one is don't grumble. I, you can probably see, but for some reason, what I have at the top, I cannot see because I've got a, something that's in front of me. I'm not able to see it. Um, but don't grumble is another aspect of what we need to see, especially against one another. Uh, when others oppress us, we are likely to vent our frustrations as those closest and dearest to us. For example, a man after a bad day at work often takes it out on his family, his wife and family. Yeah, that definitely can happen. Um, I tried my best to never let that happen. I cannot say I've it's always been successful. I think a lot of us, when we have very stressful days and we come into our home, you know, we kind of want there to be some peace and safety and 
sometimes when we come home, we may get some, you know, some news and something that just piles on top of, you know, whatever we've gone through. And it's the, the part of us is, is explosion time. You can't explode at work because, you know, you'll get in trouble. So you explode when you get home and you'll take it out on, on, on other parts of the family. And that's something that we are not supposed to do. Don't grumble. Uh, so brethren uh, are likely to direct their frustration towards each other when being oppressed from outside. Uh, we have good reason not to grumble. Uh, lest you be condemned. The sin of grumbling is a serious one. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 through 11. Yet God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Oh, man, I cannot see this. I don't know why this is here. Oh, I cannot see this. Oh, I don't know why. There's a part of this I cannot see. Let me do this. Oh. I'm trying to get this back up again. It's doing it. Okay. Don't know why, but it's doing this. Okay. Uh, it says, nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. The same Lord who will judge those who oppress others will judge those who murmur and grumble. So are there any questions regarding that? Well, I wish yeah. I knew what's wrong with this, but... I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but I've, I've got this these instructions at the top, which don't enable me to see what I need to see. So that's okay. We're going to go forward. Uh, let me see. Let's do this. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So the last, uh, next one is don't swear. Uh, this is something, uh, this is something else one is likely to do when in trouble. In other words, make rash promises, promises which God will hold you to, even if not serious. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7. As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. It is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises and don't be hasty and bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are here on the earth. So let your words be few. Oh, I tell you, I don't know about this one. Um, can anybody read the rest of this for me? It's hard for me to see. What do you want, Red? Too much. Of the rest of this scripture. Too much activity gives you restless dreams. Too many words make you a fool. Okay. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through. For God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you made to him. It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not to keep it. Don't let your mouth make you sin. And don't defend yourself by telling the temple messenger, that the promise you made was a mistake. That would make God angry and he might wipe out everything you have achieved. Talk is cheap, like daydreams and other useless activities. Fear God instead. Amen. This 
Uh, prohibition applies especially to flippant oaths. In Jesus' day, many Jews were prone to swear in this fashion. Uh, Michelle, keep, uh, read this number two for me, please. Where they made the distinction between oaths using God's name and other oaths, those using his name were considered binding while others were not. Amen. Now I can continue to read. Uh, both James, both Jesus and James condemned this distinction between different kinds of oaths. Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Okay, you have also heard that our ancestors were told, you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. Do not say by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. Do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. So what it's trying to tell us to do is make sure that what we do, we, we stand upon what we say. Um, when we make an oath or make a promise, even if we somehow cannot fulfill it, we need to own up to that and make sure that we apologize for one, for not being able to, but make sure that you're going to be able to do something that you say you're going to do. And don't say you're going to do something and then don't do it. I'm reminded of the scripture and it's a, it's a, it's, it's a parable where you had, and Jesus was talking about um, I guess it was two sons. You had one who the father said, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't remember the exact scripture, but he said to one son, go out into the field and do this. And the son said, yes, I will. And he didn't do it. But he said to the other son, go out to the field. And the son just went and done it. He didn't say he would or didn't say he wouldn't, but this one he hadn't done it. Which one is more blessed the one that actually did what he said he would do you know don't don't say you'll do something especially if you know it's really beyond what you're able to do just in order to appease somebody but then you can't do it or you don't do it yet your yeses be yeses and that your noes be noes learn the art of saying no in certain situations I've had to learn that that's hard sometimes when you know that you need to help somebody or you know you need to do something or you know you want to do something, but it's beyond your capability. Don't, don't, don't say, oh, yeah, I can do this. Oh, yeah, I can, I can, I can. But then before you know it, you found yourself in a bad situation. You're not able to complete it or you're not able to complete it to the satisfaction of the person that you said you could do it for. You know, we, we have a lot of people, I, I know a lot of people that are, what do they call them, Michelle? Um, 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 jacks of all trade and masters of none. Yeah. A lot of people can, you know, they think they can do a lot of things and they'll even say, oh yeah, I can do this, I can do that. And then they get into it and before you know it, they couldn't. We had a bad situation where we had our bathroom. I was given this guy's name that he could do this for us and this guy, so oh, this guy's great. He can do that. Uh, I hired him. I hired him. And oh my goodness. He did a horrible job. Horrible job. But he just assured me, oh, I can do this. I can do that. I can da 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 da. And this is just one of those same situations. You're going to tell me you can do something, but in actuality, you really can't. So you messed us up. And I had to have somebody come behind him to help fix what this guy messed up. Make sure that your yeses are yeses and your noes are noes.
Okay. Somebody else read this, Matthew 23, 16 to 22, please. I can't see it. Is there something in your way that you can't see it too? I just see you on my screen right now. Okay. Let's see. Wow. Okay. It said you just, the host disabled participants screen sharing. Okay. Let me, let me, let me do this and let me try it again. Let me try sharing again. I don't know why it did this. It said you disabled. Let's try this. What about now? It says host started screen sharing. Can you guys see now? Yes. Okay. I don't know what happened. I did something before. But now I can even see everything. So thank God. Here we go. Okay. Matthew 23, 16 and 22 says, Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple but that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools, which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that to swear by the altar is not binding, but to swear by the gift on the altar is binding. How blind. For which is more important, the gift on the altar or the altar that makes the gift sacred? When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it and by everything on it. When you swear by the temple, you are swearing by it and by God who lives in it. When you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and by God who sits on the throne. So this is talking about you making an oath or you saying you're going to do something and don't do it or you're promising things that you really know you cannot do. It's telling you, don't do it. Don't say, well, you know, I can do it if the Lord helps me. What? No. Be upfront, be truthful. I can't do it. Or, hey, I'm going to do it. You make a time frame of it, you keep that. Do what you say you're going to do, or just say no. <laughs> okay. So any questions so far? Okay. All right. The solution is to refrain from oaths altogether and stand by your word. Finally, in times of oppression, those who are God's children uh, have a powerful weapon in their arsenal. To utilize it, they should. The last one is pray. This is a key to things when we, uh, this is a key to things to do when oppressed. As we learn then from James 5.13, are any of you suffering hardship? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Now, I know this goes into actually starting next week's lesson because it starts in the verse 13 because we only went 5 through 12. We wanted you to pull this because this is part of that same key is to pray. This is what the Christians of James Day were doing. Says, so for listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you cheated and pay. The cries of those uh, who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. They pray. We must pray. When we pray, God hears, as seen in James 5 4. As promised by both James, uh, Jesus and James, the Lord will avenge his righteous ones. Luke 18 7 through 8. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? This is dealing with the unjust judge. The, the, the woman kept coming to him all the time. I need justice. I need justice. Day and night, she kept on coming. That's what he's saying. If we cry out to him, 
Won't he avenge us? Won't he take care of us? Won't he answer us? He will stand for us, but we've got to pray. It may not come when we want it, and the Lord may bear long with us. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And the Lamb broke the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred by, for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world? And avenge our blood for what they have been, uh, for what they have done to us. And a white robe was given to each of them. And they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus who were martyred, had joined them. When the time is ripe, the oppressed will be avenged. Are there any questions? No. This is had some technical difficulties during this one today, but um, let's give a quick conclusion so we can wrap this one up. This one was tough, and I'm going to send you all the hard copies so you'll be able to go back through all of these again. Uh, therefore, when we are being oppressed, number one or a don't resist. Be patient. Establish your hearts. Don't grumble. Don't swear. And pray. When we react this way to oppression, we follow the example of Christ and the early disciples who committed themselves to God who judges righteously. Christ, 1 Peter 2, 23. He did not, uh, 1 Peter 2, 23, he did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. The disciples, 1 Peter 4.19. So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. With such, righteous God, with such a righteous God on our side, it should be a lot easier to endure those who oppress us. Is the righteous God on your side, or rather, are you on his side? <laughs> Bless you. Are there any questions or any comments regarding this lesson? This was a tough one. Because it causes us to, even as being strong warriors, to have to use a lot of restraint when we're dealing with the spirits that are utilizing people to battle us. I keep trying to say that because I, we, we really have got to s utilize our mindset to realize it's not flesh and blood. Our warfare is not with flesh and blood. Every battle we fight is a spiritual battle. And we know that it is the enemy that's using people to attack us. They don't know they're being used. You know what I Oh, they know what they're doing. Not in the sense of spiritual warfare. You gotta look beyond what you see in your in your in your natural eye and see that it is a spiritual attack. And that's why this, this passage of scripture is telling you about utilizing the restraint that you need in order to make sure that God, let me go back to that. God is on your side. He is the one 
who will take care of all of that for you? We got to make sure that we stand holy in every situation that we encounter. And it's not always easy to do. I told you guys before, I had a, I had an, you know, an issue that I really got upset about. But I had to use some type of restraint. And we had something to happen today. And I'm so proud of Michelle because I know she wanted to explode over something that was said to us. But I have to say, God did not want us to go that way. And that's how I have to see it. God didn't want us to go that way. He wanted us to go a different way. But it was just the way that it was presented to us. I know, to me, it wasn't right. It wasn't. It wasn't right at all. And looking at it through natural eyes, it's easy to take offense of that. Looking at it through spiritual eyes, God didn't want us to do that. Spiritual eyes, God didn't want us to do that. God wanted us to go this way. And I knew that we were okay to do that, but that's not what God wanted. So we had to look at this as a situation where, okay, we can't take offense. We can't get mad. I was quiet. Michelle, it really she got quiet. <laughs> and I know that was tough because I looked at her and I'm like, oh, man. I went in the room and flipped the mattress. Yeah, it's about to be It's about to be on. <laughs> you did. You, she did some work that it takes two people to do. She did it by herself. So I know she was hot. But the Bible says you can be angry, but sin not. But you have to use restraint. And let God do what he does best, which is make your way better than what you can make for yourself. And that was always also a testimony uh, that we gave to that man by not reacting in the natural. Exactly. Because he saw us. He saw how we received that word. And it it just was not right. It wasn't right. But he that gave, good. He gave us... Good. God, God through him gave us a better, gave us another alternative, which turned out to be like hot knife through butter. It went through so quick and so fast and boom. And, and, and I'm like, cool, that'll work. We were able to do what we needed to do. But you have to have this restraint when you know there's an oppression. You have to have this restraint when you know things aren't even right. You have to have the restraint and know that you have to be patient. You can't grumble. Can't you can't make an oath. You got to pray. And you got to resist. You got to be patient. These are the things we as children of God have got to learn to do. Is it easy? Absolutely. No. It is not easy at all. But God made a promise that he'll take care of us. And I believe he will. And see us through every situation and every circumstance. Amen. And he will bless us. So are there any questions or anybody got a comment? All right, then. Our next lesson, we are coming down to the last two. It's James 5, 13 through 18. Mm -hmm. 